Once more, back to first year undergraduate microeconomics. Our topic is monopoly price discrimination. So we've kept our first three assumptions for a monopolist, homogeneous product, buyers act as price takers, and a single seller who sets the market price to maximize profit. But we've got a different fourth assumption. Instead of the monopoly setting the same price for all units to all buyers, the monopoly can set different prices to different buyers and or for different units. And in the last presentation, we looked at perfect price discrimination. We showed how, in that situation, price discrimination was efficient in the sense that it removed the deadweight loss of monopoly, but it didn't leave anything left for consumers. In this presentation, we're going to look at a slightly more realistic example. Let's run through a simple example where the monopoly will price discriminate by charging different prices to different customers. So, to make life easy, let's consider there's a product where each customer only wants to buy one unit. So it might be, say, a mobile phone, where the customer only wants one unit, second unit useless to them. So, suppose we have 70 customers all together. 60 customers are willing to pay up to but no more than $100 for the relevant product. However, the last 10 customers are willing to pay up to but no more than $120 for the relevant product. The marginal cost of production, let's make it constant, let's suppose it's just $50. Now, first let's suppose the monopoly can't price discriminate, it has to set one price for all customers. What will the price be? Well, there's two obvious choices. The monopoly will maximise profits by either setting $100 as a price and selling to all 70 customers, or setting $120 as a price and only selling to the 10 customers willing to pay $120. Which will it do? Well, let's work it out. Let's suppose first for the monopoly charges $100. It will sell to all 70 customers. It will make $7,000 revenue. Its costs, well, $50 per unit times 70 customers, that's $3,500 cost. So its profit is simply going to be revenue minus cost, 7,000 minus 3,500. Its profit will be $3,500. What about if it sets a price of 120? Well, now it only sells to 10 customers. Its revenue is only $1,200, but of course it only has to make 10 units, so its costs are only $500, 10 times 50. Its profit, $1,200 minus $500, its profit is $700. So, it can either make $700 by charging $120 for the unit price, or it can make $3,500 by setting a per unit price of $100 per unit. Clearly it prefers $100 per unit. So, if a monopoly can only charge a single price, in this example it will sell to all customers at a price of $100. It will make $3,500 profit. What about consumer surplus? Well, notice the consumers who are only willing to pay $100, they get no surplus. They're paying $100, and that was their marginal value for the product. But the customers who are willing to pay $120, they only have to pay $100. So they get $20 surplus on each unit they buy. There's 10 of them, they buy 10 units, so that's $200 of consumer surplus. So that's easy. Now, what if the monopoly can price discriminate? So suppose that all of the 10 customers who are willing to pay $120, let's suppose they all have red hair. They're all gingers. And let's suppose that none of the other customers, none of the customers who are only willing to pay $100 have red hair. So the monopoly is able to set two prices, a ginger price of $120 and a non-ginger price of $100. What's the outcome? Well. The monopoly will sell 10 units at $120, makes $1,200 revenue from the red-headed customers, and it will sell 60 units at $100, makes 
make $6,000 from the non-headheads. So its total revenue will be $7,200 when it price discriminates. Costs, well, selling 60 units plus 10 units at 70 units at $50 per unit cost, so its costs are $3,500, and its profit will be $3,700. The $7,200 revenue less the $3,500 worth of cost. Notice that its profit with price discrimination $3,700 is more than its profit without price discrimination. Without price discrimination, its profit was only $3,500. What about consumer surplus? Well, consumer surplus is gone. That's where the extra profit came from. The $200 of consumer surplus that went to the redheads when there was no price discrimination has now been turned into profit. So that's a situation where there was no deadweight loss but price discrimination was still able to improve profit by turning consumer surplus into monopoly profit. A good thing for the monopolist, a bad thing for redheads. Let's now look at a slightly different example. We're still going to have our 70 people. They're still going to be interested in buying one but only one unit of a particular product, like a mobile phone. But this time we'll have 60 people who are willing to pay up to, but no more than $120 each. And we have 10 people willing to pay up to, but no more than $100 each. And we'll have the marginal cost of an item still equal to $50. So if our monopoly wants to profit maximize, it's either going to set a price of $100 and sell to all 70 people, or it's going to set a price of $120 and only sell to the 60 consumers who are willing to pay $120. The other 10 will miss out. They're not willing to pay $120. They're only willing to pay $100. Well, what's the difference from the monopoly's point of view? If it sets a price equal to $100, it's going to sell to all 70 customers, so its revenue will be $7,000. Its cost will be $3,500, that's just 70 times the $50 marginal cost. So its profit is going to be $3,500. So that's the first alternative for the monopoly. What about if the monopoly sets a price equal to $120 per item? Well, notice in that situation, it's only going to sell to the 60 Customers with a high willingness to pay, 60 times 120, that's going to give revenue of 7,200. The cost will be, well, 60 times 50, 3,000. So its profit is going to be $4,200. So that's the profit to the monopoly from the second option, setting the higher price. Notice that in this example, the monopoly will want to set the higher price. That leads to higher profitability. It makes $700 more profit. But also notice that in this situation, there is now a deadweight loss. What's a deadweight loss? Well, it's the difference between the marginal cost and the willingness to pay over the 10 consumers who are not served at a price of $120. So it's going to be 50 dollar loss on each of the 10 consumers, that's a deadweight loss of $500 if the monopoly cannot price discriminate. Okay, so now let's introduce the possibility of price discrimination. What's going to happen if a monopoly can now set a different price for the 60 consumers than for the 10 consumers. So as before, let's imagine that the 10 consumers, well, they're identifiable, they may have red hair, for example, so we again can have a different price to red-haired people than we have to people who don't have red hair. The red-headed people will get a price of $100, everyone else has to pay $120. So there's a ginger discount now. What's going to be the outcome? Well, under price discrimination, the monopoly is going to be selling 60 units at 120. It's going to be selling 10 units at 100. So the revenue of a monopoly is going to be equal to $8,200. 
What about the cost for the monopoly? Well, it's producing 70 units at $50 a unit. That's going to be $3,500 for the cost. So the difference between them is going to give the monopoly profit. If the monopoly can price discriminate, then its profit's going to be $4,700. Let's pop a dollar sign in there. Notice that the monopoly is better off under price discrimination than when it couldn't price discriminate. How much better off? Well, notice that the monopoly profit has gone up by exactly $500. Why? Well, the monopoly has been able to turn the $500 deadweight loss into profit by having price discrimination. Consumers get no surplus. They got no surplus without price discrimination. In this example, they get no surplus with price discrimination, but the deadweight loss disappears. So, the price discrimination is efficient in the sense that it leads to more efficient trade. But it doesn't provide anything for customers, with or without price discrimination, in this simple example. Now, there's lots more we can do here. We are on the edge of a huge area of both economics and business strategy, and that is, how should businesses set their pricing? How should they strategically price to maximise profits? That goes well beyond first-year undergraduate microeconomics, though that's it for this course. We're not going to go any further down that pricing direction. Next time, we're going to move on to oligopoly. Talk to you then.